Testing. All right, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I think we're ready to start the conversation. Um, my name is Dalmo. I work for a company called Workday, and I do machine learning applied to financials uh, over there. Um, the opinions here are my own. It's not the, the company's opinions, but uh, we're going to have a lot of fun looking at uh, what is to come. Let's uh, start by trying to build a little bit of trust. If I say, can you give me what's in your wallet? You don't have to answer that. Uh, yeah, you don't have to answer that. It, it is not a fair question because I'm not giving anything in return and I'm asking to get what is in your wallet, you don't even know me and you don't have any, any trust uh, built yet, right? I'm, um, I haven't even given the price for what I'm offering and I'm offering you no value yet, they're just asking something. So it's not a good way to start and build trust. Um, Trust without context, you say, oh, you trust everyone. It's like, sometimes it could happen, but it, it is rare. It doesn't come by very often, right? For example, if I go and, and do something, a machine learning model says, this transaction has been flagged, and I say, why is it flagged? Well, because the machine learning model said so. That's not a good explanation, right? We can uh, see over here. We have to get more context. You have to be able to explain why was it flagged? Can you tell me what fields, what aspect of the transaction were flagged and, and why? Let's take a look at an example. Imagine that we have a record, a transaction, financial transaction uh, record, and uh, there are three fields that we're going to classify uh, over here. And this one, it gave a confidence score of 0 0.1. Let's say it ranges from 0 to 1, 1 being 100%, 0 being very low confidence. And it came back with three classifications, 1, 2, and 3. Um, how can we try to figure out why the, the result was so low? Why the confidence score was so low? We can do a trick, not really a trick, but one technique. It's saying we remove the first field and we run the inference again. Now we see the result was a little bit better. From 0 0.1 it went to 0 0.15. Well, we could say maybe the first field is the one causing the problem. Now we see another one. We remove the second field instead of the first one. We put the first field back and we remove the second field. Now we see the, the confidence score went, went to 0 0.92, which is much better, right? The last one, we remove the third field, we have to the operation has to be complete. We have to see the whole transaction taking place, testing with each one of the fields, and see what is the confidence score that comes in the back, right? And we can see over here that uh, this row seems to provide the best result. And uh, the explanation over here, we can, uh, we can see that the field, the classification number two, was the only one causing the problem. And we can say, well, the confidence score was a bad one because the classification two was wrong. That is a better explanation. That's a good explanation to why the confidence score was, was low and uh, one way for you to start uh, building trust. That was a good example. If we had said the the first, uh, the, the second row over here, the one where we removed the, the first classification, and if we had said, 
that is our best answer, that's not good enough because the confidence score is still 0 0.15 and we would not build trust that way, even though we had given an explanation, but it would not have been a good explanation. So there would be no trust to build over there. We're gonna go back to top, the topic of trust in a moment, but first we're gonna take a look at game theory. We, it's gonna be a, f a key component in uh, what we're gonna be discussing uh, uh, today. So game theory is a mathematical framework where um, to model the, and uh, analyze a situation where two people are, inter two or more people are um, interacting with each other. Um, in many cases, the outcome of the next move depends on the previous move. Chess is a good example for that. Depending on your strategy when you make a move, then your opponent, even though may have a strategy, but may change that strategy as it goes because of the move you made. Um, let's see another example that is uh, very famous. It's called the prisoner's dilemma. If you guys are not familiar with the prisoner's dilemma, let's take a look at how it works. Let's say there are two prisoners, but you don't have enough evidence to convict either of them. And uh, each one of them, you're speaking with each one of them in a separate room. They are not seeing what is happening uh, to each other. They don't know what each other is going to be, um, are going to be answering. They have, each one of them has two options, and I'm symbolizing each one of them with the color orange or the color blue or green, uh, how it's rendering over there. The first option is none of them talks. And if none of them talks, let's say that each one gets a sentence of two years in jail. They say, okay, I'm not going to talk. Each one gets uh, a sentence of two years in jail. But one of them can come back and, uh, and say, I actually am going to talk because a deal was offered to me that if I talk, then the other, I, I go free, I am set free, and the other person is going to spend 12 years in, in jail. Now you have an incentive over there. Now the person is thinking, should I stay quiet? What if the other person talks and I don't talk? Then I go to jail, but the other person doesn't. So my incentive is, do I really trust the other person? Or should I just talk and, and whatever the other person does, well, the other person does. Then you think, okay, I have the, the two incentives over there. The, the, the person on the other side is gonna be also thinking, oh, should I talk or not talk? Eventually, it comes to a thing called the Nash equilibrium, uh, named after John Nash. And if you guys have seen the movie, A Beautiful Mind, it, uh, it tells like a great story. It's uh, highly recommend watching. But if both of them talk, each one gets seven years in jail, right? So you're gonna risk, do I trust the other person completely? Then each one spends two years in jail. Do I stay quiet and then the other person talk and I go to jail, the other person doesn't, or do I speak? In the end, the incentive is everyone's gonna talk because you try to minimize the time spent in jail. Not talking comes with a potential penalty of spending 12 years in jail versus if I talk, uh, I spend only seven years. So a lot of game theory sometimes is on non-cooperative games. This one is non-cooperative because each one is compete, each one of the prisoners competing for their own freedom or minimizing the time they spent in jail. There are other modalities on the cooperative games. Let's talk a little bit more about that. So 
let's say there's an actor and you have on one side something not trustworthy and on the other side, uh, the other end of the spectrum, you have a situation that uh, you consider to be trustworthy. The first question that comes to mind is, what is the threshold for being trustworthy? Right? We can put a bar over here and say, is this a good threshold? I don't know. Maybe. We can try to move this a little bit over here to the bottom and say, that may be too low, right? It's, it's a very low bar to, to gain trust of, uh, of someone. You can be very, uh, let me go, sorry, I'm going to go back over here. That one, on the other hand, is the very high bar. You say, oh, I need something, very, a guarantee of some, something before I consider trustworthy. So, but perhaps we can compute what is that trust um, for being um, trustworthy. Um, how do we go about doing that? Let's build a trust game. So there are going to be two actors over here. The first one is a truster, someone who is trying to gain the trust. The second one is trustee. So the trust is trying to gain the trust from the trustee. But there's something interesting over here. The truster has to be trustworthy. If you try to act as someone who is not trustworthy, you, you already started this game in the wrong way, right? Um, the truster also, also has to be trusting. It has to be willing to trust the other person. But the same is not true for the trustee. So the trustee does not have to be trustworthy. For example, you can have, do business with someone who supports a different sports team from yours, right? You know that their sports team is not as good as yours, but you still can do business with them. So the trustee doesn't, does not need to be trustworthy. But what you're trying to change is for them to be not trusting, to become trusting. You want the trustee to trust you. And that's how you want to start building trust. I don't know if you guys have seen uh, an American show called Whose Line Is It Anyways? It's a very funny show. And they say that uh, the points don't matter. And that's where we're going to start over here. With, we're going to start with a million points. It doesn't matter. You can be a billion points or just one, how, how, whichever number you want to pick. Or 42. 42 is a good number, too. Uh, and we're going to start playing a game. So this um, game over here, we still have our two actors. We have the truster and the trustee. And you see that underneath each one of them, there's a pie. And we're going to either increase the size of the pie or reduce the size of the pie. And that's how we're going to start uh, building trust. So the first one, the truster, has to create something of value. And I'm symbolizing with that letter V on top of truster um, over there. Has to create something of value and be willing to offer that value to the trustee. How is it going to do that? So it's going to give that value. And we're going to do a little bit of math over here, but multiplication is the most complicated part uh, of it. So uh, bear with me. So the trust is going to do a remittance. Just, that's a f just a funny word for sending uh, value uh, to the trustee. 
But you notice a, lot of, a small little P over there is not all the value that was generated by the, the truster, perhaps not all the value can be sent to the trustee. Imagine the value being a product. Uh, many of us work in software companies and we build a product and the offering sometimes has tiers that you have to have a free tier or a paid tier, an enterprise one, or maybe the trustee doesn't use all the features of the product. So there's usually just a portion of the value that is sent uh, to, the, uh, to the trustee. Or maybe it's consuming 100%. So that small little P over there is gonna vary between zero. That, it means that you're gonna be sending no value or all the way to one where you're gonna be sending all the value that you produced. So, and you're gonna send that value to the trustee. The moment that you send that, you saw that the size of the pie underneath the truster got a little bit smaller because it's giving some value away. But of course, the truster doesn't want to see its pie shrinking to, to nothing. Um, let's deal with uh, these dynamics and see what's gonna happen over here. A trustee, on the other hand, has to receive value perhaps in a greater magnitude than the value that the trust is sending to the trustee. So let's see, symbolize this letter K on top of the trustee as a magnification value. It's saying, how can you receive more value than the truster uh, sent to you? Let's see an example. Imagine a book. An author writes a book, let's say a great book. When you read it, you become richer by reading that book. So for you, the value that you got from reading that book was bigger than the value that the truster sent to you, the author of the book sent to you. Could be a textbook, could be a book about new technologies. Now you learn, you gain um, a new expertise and it became better. So you perceive the value of the, the book that you read um, to be larger. So the trustee can receive that you see that the equation changes a little bit. I put that letter K, that is a magnification value, next to the remittance that is being sent to the trustee. But you can say, well, but sometimes that magnification value could be negative or could be zero. That, that's a problem, right? We are hoping that the magnifications be only that it increases the value. We're gonna see all those use cases. But then, you sent the value to the trustee and you see that the size of the pie increased. Now you have a dynamics over there where you see the value can, starting with those points that don't matter, but we're still computing those points, right? You can send in, uh, that value. We see the trustee, we see a magnification factor. Are you perceiving that the value that you received is more than what the trust, uh, trust are sent to you? Imagine you're paying for a software subscription Right? You may be paying like $10 for it, but is it worth to you more than $10? Then you are net positive, right? You're gaining value over there. Right now, we only see one way. How about if we make this relationship two-way? How? Let's get a small percentage of that value that was received by the trustee and send it back to the truster. How can that be? Well, if you purchase a software or any other product, uh, you have to pay for it, right? So that's one way of you sending value back. In terms of machine learning, you could be interacting with a machine learning model and uh, sending some information back, usability, where you, you're saying, well, this result was a good result, this one was not a good result, so that feedback can be used in future versions of, of the model to make it better. So we're sending, we're giving back some of the result. You see that we received that, uh, that G value over there, that is the gain that we received. We're multiplying, but just like a small factor Q, uh, that's gonna, again, gonna be between zero and one because maybe the trustee doesn't want to send anything back or maybe it won't, and then it sends that value back to the truster. Now, the size of the pie of the trustee is 
just a tiny little bit smaller, but the value of the pi of the truster grew a little bit. If the truster has many trustees, then you have the dynamics where everyone ends up a, a, a winner. But it depends on being able to create value, send value. That value has to be perceived as uh, a gain of value. You're receiving more than you are um, giving back. And you send some information back in terms of like uh, either payment for the service or you give feedback on training um, uh, a machine learning model. Now you start building a, a cycle of, uh, of trust. Let's see some real simulations with that. Um, so the first one, imagine that magnification factor that, that I mentioned before being greater than one. And as you remember, we started with uh, magic a million points, right? Um, so we have several iterations on uh, this dynamics. In this case, it's just four. But you see over there on the first iteration, the trustee is represented by the orange color and the truster, the blue color, right? You see that both of them are gaining from the transaction. They're getting more and more points, um, the trustee and, uh, and the truster. So it is a good transaction for all of them. You start building that trust. And you want to see how this curve behaves over time. That's what I said about the, the points not matter. But they, they do matter, not the absolute value, but how they make this curve take shape. If over time that curve is becoming steady, we're going to take a look more. Uh, in some more examples later on, but if that curve becomes steady, you see that trust is being generated, and uh, if it starts going down, you see some erosion of trust. Let's see another use case where the K, the magnification value, is equal to one. So the value that you are uh, generating is being perceived with the same value by the trustee. So you see the trustee is still gaining uh, some, some value over there. Actually, let me go back one, one slide. Let's take a look at the scale of the, the chart. I'm, I'm changing the scale so we can see the behavior of the curve changing. Later, we're going to plot all of them together at the same scale. But right now, it becomes easy to see the behavior of the curve and how it changes. So this one is going for from 450,000 to 1.8 million. The next one, you see the scale changed. It's going from 300,000 to 700,000. So the band is narrower. The value that has been created is less. But in this case over here, the truster is sending something of value. The trustee is benefiting from that, but the truster, well, is not gaining over time. Is this all that bad? Actually, no. During the phase where you are developing a product, for example, developing machine learning models, and you have early adopters that are working with you, this is a perfectly acceptable scenario, right? The trustees that are still working with you, they are gaining value. You are gaining value as well because you are debugging the system and uh, you're building in, in a way where it, once it becomes generally available, Everyone's going to be gaining from that. Another case here is imagine that the magnification factor is between zero and one. So now you start seeing the case where one, the truster is losing quite a bit, and the trustee is gaining almost nothing. You see that the value over there. Uh, is not really gaining because the scale of the, the, the chart is very small. Last but not least is when k is smaller than zero. So there's the magnification factor is actually reducing value both for the truster and the trustee. In those cases, you have a machine learning model that is always giving the wrong results 
it's causing uh, the, the trustee, to, or in that case would be a customer, to do rework. Um, so you're not really creating value, you're generating more work for, uh, for the trustee. It's not a good case uh, to, to, create, um, uh, to create trust. You actually create a rapid erosion um, of trust in that case. Let's see everything side by side. So you see the scale over there. Mine, again, the, uh, the scale of each one of the charts, uh, they're, they're different, but you see the behavior of the curves. Over time, they tell you, am I generating trust with the trustee or with the customer? Or are we losing, uh, losing trust? Now let's see the very same picture, but the scale of the graph is gonna be exactly the same. So you see how the, the effects are only positive when you have the magnification factor uh, bigger than one. So it's the same picture. You see the behavior of the, of the curves now. The, the, the upper right and the bottom, uh, they're almost linear. They're creating pretty much no value. So the, the real uh, case where you want to create trust is when your product creates uh, creates value that is perceived by the customer that I'm creating, I'm receiving or gaining more value than what the, the truster or the vendor is trying to, uh, trying to offer. So how do we want to see uh, that curve going over time? Of course, it would be kind of a, almost impossible for you to have just achieve a level of trust and stay there forever. You're gonna have new versions of the product. That product can have a little bug here or it can have some issues that you need to address. So there's gonna be some gentle fluctuation in, in trust. But you want to see something like this. Right? It's a gentle curve. It goes up, goes down, but you don't see something that goes up too much or go down too much. The next one, this would be a bad, a bad example of trying to create trust because you see those high peaks, low valleys, and uh, the relationship with customer becomes a very delicate one because that sometimes you're creating trust, that sometimes you are eroding trust. Inevitably it leads at the end, we see over here, that customer just leaves and say, hey, we're not gonna continue this cycle over here because I'm not getting any trust um, from the system or from the product that you are um, doing. And even worse, you see here that uh, I left the graph below zero when the customer breaks up because it could be the case that not only they no, no longer trust your product, but they could go to other companies or social media and they can talk badly about your product and say, hey, it didn't work for me, don't, don't trust this company, don't uh, do this. It, it could be a really negative uh, value that ends up being with, with, with customer. So this way we can see a framework where we can measure trust over time, starting from any arbitrary value. And by looking at the shape of a curve, how it's plotted over time, then we can see, are we building trust? Are we trustworthy? Are our customers trusting in us and continuing their relationship? So this is one way uh, to do that. And with that, let's talk here. Let's talk online. Um, it was great to, to have you all.
wants to project, but um, I want to understand better. I'm, I'm not as in the technical weeds and the machine learning side, so I may have some novice questions just to clear. So we're looking at here uh, propos mathematical propositions and how we can improve the model to create trust on um, so that when, let's say, uh, a company is building their own AI solution, they're able to create trust with their users and customers to have a predictable uh, flow um, rather than that roller coaster graph that you're um, you proposed. So um, through the different different uh, like alterations or flavors of the algorithm, these are you're proposing uh, different solutions um, using 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 what? I'm, I guess I'm confused of. Um, if you can explain, explain like I'm five, <laughs> the, uh, what's, what's going on here, what's the proposed solution, and how can companies benefit from something like this? Perfect. Thank you for the question. Let's go back a few slides over here uh, and take a look at this uh, um, dynamics again. The first one is the trust are creating something of value. It's almost like an altruistic act where the trust I can say, I'm going to build a product first, and uh, customers will love that. And it could be a machine learning model, could be other products that, uh, that is built, but it has to add value. That's the, the V over there. Then I'm going to send that value to a customer. So the value over there, the initial value, could be the million points that, uh, that we discussed the, the, the other slide. Right. Then I'm going to be sending it to value to, to the customer. And we are proposing that the customer has to perceive that value with a magnification factor. And that would be that, that letter K over there. Right? So it's going to be the K multiplied by the R. So you have a magnification factor. That's going to be the gain given to the trustee. Right? Now the pie is grown back. And you ask something in return. It's not necessary, but it would be nice to have something in return. That something would be a small fraction of the gain value uh, that we are representing with the letter Q. So once you receive a little bit of that value back, you're going to see that the trustee, because it gave something back, the size of the pie is going to reduce a little bit, and the size of the pie of the truster is going to grow a little bit. Right? So it receives the value, and that dynamics is where you can track over time and you want to see that gentle fluctuation on the graphs. If the value that is being sent to the trustee is eroding trust, so the trustee's pie is going to start reducing to the point where you just break up. And uh, it doesn't matter if the trustee is sending value back or, or not because you're not offering anything of real value uh, to the trustee. Does it answer your question? If the argument is that the, the, the K coefficient and the Q coefficient need to be basically you know, greater than one or whatever it is in whatever context, mm -hmm. uh, in order to increase trust and to have a more you know, constant uh, fluctuation rather than the roller coaster, what are the practical applications in like your actual product design or um, machine learning model like training or like in, in transparency and explainability, like what are the practical things we can do to increase um, those outputs? That's a great question. Um, I think you, you're only going to see that uh, manifesting over time. First, you have to pick what are the values that are important to you. For example, you can say, is my, my server crashing all the time? When customers go to the website, is it crashing all the time? Um, have I received any reports of uh, unfair bias? Uh, you can track all those metrics and create a compilation of what do you consider to be value that you are creating. Whatever those metrics that you are choosing, you can either assign arbitrary values to them, or some others is, are going to be more concrete. For example, number of crashes, that one is easy, right? It only goes up. Right? You had one crash, two crashes, and you can do that. Oh, I'm going to measure that per month. So every month it, you reset the number. So you make that collection of metrics and just be consistent on the metrics and how you measure them. 
then that's going to be your initial million points. As I said, the, the, the number, the points really uh, don't matter, but you want to pay attention to the shape of the curve over time, like this one. You want to see the shape of the curve over time, irrespective of your metrics. Then you see if your curve, let's skip a few slides over here. So if your curve is moving like this one, where you have gentle fluctuations on trust, that's where you see I'm creating value and customers are happy with that. I can be affirmative that I'm creating value and it's being perceived well. If it gets like this, eh, good luck. <laughs> yeah, I can repeat the question over here. I think the question was. Uh, okay. Please. Damn, what was my question? Um, it's been a long day. Oh, yes. Because uh, earlier on, before the talk even started, we were one on one talking. Because, uh, by the way, doing a talk on the intersection of AI and DEI, DEI tomorrow at 1155. Sorry, no shameless <laughs> plug. Um, but we should work together. Anyways. I, I'm looking at it from the policy perspective, you're looking at it from the math mathematical perspective, so definitely um, love it. But I, I wanted to see what is the consistent theme here, uh, how do you boil it down to the essence of mitigating bi bias before it becomes problematic in the AI, which then causes the problems, because that's one of the, the root causes of, of uh, how um, AI can get out of control and, and start automating, automating decisions and, and making um, life difficult for humans when it's excluding uh, parts of the population uh, that uh, you know, these models were trained on. So I wanna hear more of the implication of that or how, when I'm looking at these mathematical models, uh, is the goal to, uh, like yeah, at what, at what point in the process is, is bias being mitigated? It's a great question. Um, yes, bias is always present in, uh, in machine learning. And bias is a qualitative metric is not necessarily a quantitative metric. However, you can quantify it. Right. You can have processes in place and uh, take notes on was any case of bias reported, right? And you can count the number of cases of biases reported and you can even attach a severity score. It could be just a magnifying weighting of the bias. Oh, this was something trivial, this one was something major, something critical, and each one of them can get that score and you multiply by one, by two, by three, depending on how you want to amplify. How much security vulnerability in that way? Exactly. Um, then you get that what was quali uh, qualitative, now you transform into something quantitative. Mm -hmm. Now you can input that as part of the metrics that you are collecting, mm -hmm. right? But because it was qualitative, you also have to take the, the, the other side and say, of those issues that were reported in biases, how many of them have I issued a fix for that? So if you say there was a bias issue reported and you increase one metric by one, and one week later you say, hey, uh, the machine learning model was retrained and address that issue. Now you have to increase the other one. You either increase the positive one that the issue has been fixed, or you reduce the original one to the original place, right? You have to be careful so you don't have this bias metric only growing over time and never reducing, because if you issue the fix and the, and the reported issue has truly been addressed, now you have to decrease, right? Because you want to see how your curve goes back. It could be uh, a particular case that the reported bias issue causes one of those valleys that trust is lost. But then once you issue the fix, trust goes back up. 
right? If you have one valley, that shouldn't be a bad thing. Right? Or, or it could be even a more gentle one if the issue with bias wasn't uh, so bad. So there's going to be that uh, fluctuation. So just in your framework, add the number of bias reports that were uh, reported, uh, report bias issues that were reported. Attach a magnification factor to it. Is it like a minor, major, critical? Um, and do the counterbalance once you issue a fix that should report well and fit uh, well in this framework. All right. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the conference.